tu ia terangi tu nei tu ia tapa peta kotu nei tu ia kita hele tangga ta karungo te po karungo te o ati hei maudora e me hanga na te atu ai te timo tangga terangi me te fenu kotu me hei kita atu te timo tangga te kupu paka mau terungo pai kiu kita fenu ara hani kita tangga ta kotu ai nai maket maket tonu kati kara ka faka tu fera te nei o ta te nei kau papa kei rote na kupu ari ki na faka moi met me me hono no aira au o kupu ki te nei o ta te nei kai anga. Ai a tau te kaha pora te ata ki wairori te kuturo te ata nei. O rei na hai a tau a pūtai tu a pūtai waho te pake aka te rangi. O mai e nduku, o mai e rangi, o mai e te maro whenua i. Ki rongo a tāne, ki daro a tāne, te rangi hu a tāne, paku paku a tāne. Nō honga te ronga tira ka puta tērā te mana waka tō ki te whenua i. Ka tauha whaka tauha, kia tīna whaka tīna, hui e tāi ki e. A wa momo kupu i whaari ki hia nei. E karakia ta tāte nei tūpuna a rākai hutu. Nāna nei i whaka tūwhera te aratika ta rōra ki tēne o tāte nei. Taki wā mai te pātaka a rākai hutu i tai nō ki tana puna. A te kitika. Nā rei rea mihi ana, e mihi ana, e mihi ana. Huri ake rā, kia mihi ake rā, i o tāte nei tini kahurangi, ko rei rea tui rā ki te pūri, ki te pōtango tango, i ngā roi mata aroha. Nā waipuke aroha kei waina koutou e te rōpi whakeke me whāre ki hia, i rongo te papatapi kia mihi a kia tangi hiwai tatu. Nā rea rā rātou ko rea tui rā ki te pūri ki te pōtango tango i mamai aroa tēnei. Heo kia te rā ki ngā ukai pō ki te oki oki ngā mata tangata ki te hui mano o te kahurangi. Nā rea rā rea tui rā oki oki ai e moi. Heo ki mai rā ki a tātou i tātou tēnā tangata ki te whaiao ki te ao mārama tātou ki te pari a te rā ka tū a te hei maurora. Tai te mui tai pari ngā waia maha nui ki ngā pōpō o te raki hauia. E heke ana e tūna mai uru kai te raki ki te hāpu a muru wai o whata. Nei nei ana te pāti ki te tahu o ranga ki tangata te tohu o ranga tira tanga ki te iwi. Pūpū mai te haua tāwhiri e whakapuana i ngā aua huka mi ngā pākehi whakateka teka a waita a e a te hei mauri ora. Are tēnei hei te mihi ki a koe, ko taurā e nā kaitiaki o tēnei a tātēnei waka. Ka koe hoki e te minita, ko tatu mai rā, whaka nui e whaka mana, whaka rangatira tēnei o tātou nei kaupapa. Rongo nui e whaka horo nei. Ko hoki atu rā, ki nga hua o nehe rā, mā te wai, me te whenua, ki oro ai te tangata. Nā da tēnei hoki te mihi, tēnei o tātou nei papatapu, a ngai te rua hekeki, me tana noho ke raro te mauri, a ta tātou nei koro wai hukoko, o auraki, me ana wai, E rei rea tui rā ki te tai a maha nui, ki te tūranga rā nā waka a uruo, a taki timu. Nā rei rea tēnei hoki te mihi ki a koe, nā mahara mai whakatau mai rā. Whakatau mai rā i rungi te hā, ta tāte nei puna, a te kiti ka rākai hautu, te kiti ka tūte kaua. Me ana hā i rei rea tui rā kei waini a tātou, i roto ta tāte nei oranga. Nā rei rea e mihi ana, e mihi ana, hara mai rā. Ara mai rā, whakatau mai rā. Whakatau mai rā i ngā mōhi o tanga, ngā mārama tanga, ki tēnei o tātou nei kai paparunga nui, mi whāri ki au wā kōrero, i rata tēnei o tātou nei papatapu, a kā tū muki, ngai te rua hekeke. Nā rei rā, whakamiharo tēnei, mi te rohe pānui, koe ke mai rā, te mōhi o tanga, te mārama tanga, mi whakatika, mi piki ake te oranga o tātou nei wai, te tātou nei whenua, Ta tātou nei pamu, huri no, huri no, huri no. Nā rei rā kauri e rui e nā kōrero, huri ake rā ki a kauta rā, e nā huru huru o tēnei o tātou nei kōro wai, kauta rā i tātou mai rā, me whakatika, whakarangatira, tēnei o tātou nei kaupaparungo nui, e whāre ki hea. Nā rei rā, e mihi poto e mihi aro o tēnei. O te mea nui, me whakakotahi o ai tātou. E runga te waka, me whakaarehi tēnei o tātou nei waka ki te puna ki te taumata tei tei taumata rangatira. Nō reira, kaore e roi nga kōrero ka runga ke rā, 
te aroha mai to tate nei rangatira to tate nei manuhiri to tate nei mineta me tana mohi o tanga ke tate ka tikara ma te mohi o ka mohi o ma te aroha ka marama ma te aroha ano ki o rai te tanga ta no reira e mihi nei e tanga nei tu faka i tini nei no reira huri no huri no e te fare te na kuto te na kuto te na no tate. Tiri amanu, tiri amanu, wero i a kite po, o te raka kata, e re re kata, e tau e koi a, koi a kota, raruriki ki mai maui, e ha. Ia wai o ia no te waipuna ora ki he waipu, he waipuna, he waipu hina o te wai ora. Whakau papatia te pūno o tu ki te wai kaipu o tūnuku. Whakau rangi tia te pūno o tu ki te mana wai ora ti te tapi toa. Ko te mitinga me whakahokia te mana te mauri ki rātou ko rere ati rā. A piti hono tātai hono, te pita wairu ki te pita wairua. A piti hono tātai hono, tātou te ira tangata ki te whaiao ki te aumārama tātou ki te parea te rākā tū. Te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā nō tātou. Tēnā koutou. E te mana whenua, e te taumutu runanga, tēnā koutou. E te Minister for Agriculture, Damien O'Connor, tēnā koe. E nga kai kauni hera, e nga kora matua, tēnā koutou. Ko Nadine Domasi, aho. He kai arahi aho, e te kauni hera taio ki Waitaha. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Good morning and welcome to everybody. Welcome to all of our distinguished guests. I am very pleased to be able to welcome you here to today's Can Canterbury Farming Good Management Practice Showcase event, Kai for Tomorrow. We are privileged today to be able to welcome the Honourable Damien O'Connor, Minister for Agriculture, who will join us today to talk about the future of farming in Canterbury. Minister O'Connor and Minister Parker recently released the Good Farming Practice Action Plan for Water Quality 2018 a couple of months ago in Hamilton. Along with farming industry leaders, Federated Farmers, Beef and Lamb, Dairy NZ, Irrigation New Zealand and the Regional Council sector. I would also like to welcome here today members of the Good Farming Practice Governance Group, some of whom have travelled down from the North Island to be with us today. The governance group were a key part of releasing this national action plan for water quality. I'd also like to make a special welcome to those of you, many of you, who have partnered with us over the last 10 years as part of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. Welcome to our councillors, our mayors, and many distinguished guests, including that of the Ashburton Zone Committee, who I think are just joining us, so very, very welcome. Thank you. The idea for today's event came out of a desire to recognise and celebrate how far Canterbury has come over the last 10 years in addressing nutrient management. Today, Canterbury is leading New Zealand on how good farming practices can and are being implemented across Canterbury. The work done in Canterbury by the previous Matrix of Good Management um, Governance Group, again, some of whom, some of you are here today, to define what good, good management practice was, has been groundbreaking and is now nationally recognised um, as a basis and a foundation for collective action on water quality. So, Without much further ado, I'd now like to introduce you to our facilitator for this event, 
Ken Taylor, who is, who is currently the director of our Land and Water National Science Challenge. Previous to this role, Ken was also the Director of Science at Environment Canterbury for many years and is a key foundation champion for addressing water quality and nutrient challenges in Canterbury. So I'd now like to hand over to Ken. Uh, kia ora Nadine and, and uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, it's a, uh, and, and thank you for those, those generous words, it's actually a real privilege um, to be invited to come along and, and uh, and, and take this role today. Um, but of course, with that privilege um, comes uh, an obligation to stick to what's a very tight schedule. So I'll be endeavouring to do that. So I've got a couple of minutes to set the scene. Uh, and then we have uh, six speakers, 33% uh, of whom are called Damien. And, and I suspect that's a first for the, um, uh, for the Lincoln Event Centre, so we should celebrate that in itself. And then at the end of those, those talks, we're going to have a panel discussion, so we're going to invite those people up onto the stage, so it's an opportunity to ask questions. So think of your questions as we go through the presentations, um, and then uh, take that opportunity and fire away. Um, I, I did some uh, prep for this, um, which involved going back into my, um, my old computer files and digging out some of the stuff that um, we'd done back in, in 2013 when we started a project called The Matrix of, of Good Management. And I found an old presentation that I'd, that I'd given to commissioners, commissioners back then, and I was going to use a few of the slides, but, but mercifully I've decided not to. But the thing about that, looking back at that presentation, was a sense of what we didn't know then uh, compared to what we know now. You know, and it's only five years ago, but it's so important that we actually take some time to reflect on, on those changes. You know, we had things happening then like um, the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, which was really building up a, a, a big head of steam then. And it was thinking about um, uh, economic development in Canterbury, but most importantly, it was actually thinking about how that meshed, meshed in with the other values that were really important to us. The cultural ones, the social ones, the environmental ones, water quality, biodiversity, and, and, and Mahinga Kai, which was a subject of, of conversation we had earlier on today. We had the Land and Water Forum, which was saying, look, there's national consensus here that that good management practice is kind of the minimum uh, that as a country we should be expecting. Um, we had the National Policy Statement, uh, which, had, which had been in existence for about two years, and it was saying to regional councils, look, you're going to have to set limits in your catchments. And we had a sense then that, you know, good management practice was going to be a, an important part of that. And we were involved in the, in the, in the regional uh, land and water plan at that stage and starting to have that conversation about GMP. The problem was there were some things we didn't know. Uh, and we actually didn't know really exactly what good management practice meant. You know, good, good for what, when and who. And there was another issue too. We, we, we didn't really understand what what was equivalence? You know, what, what, what was good management practice for a grower um, compared to a dairy farmer? You know, what was the, the sort of equal pain or opportunity there? Um, and, and most importantly for us at that time is that we didn't know what the effect of people operating at good management practice would be. So if you were, you were GMP for a, for a configuration or various configurations of land use, soil, climate, slope and so forth, how much N or P would you lose from your farm? Um, but I think the conversation shifted a lot now, and we talk a lot more, or a lot, a lot less about the pain uh, and a lot more um, about the opportunity. And it's kind of that opportunity, I suppose, that, that really saw me um, you know, take the big step about two and a half years ago and, and move from Environment Canterbury to the Our Land and Water National Science Challenge. And in part, that was because the science challenge was at least you know, partly predicated on the view that um, the quality of our farming, our farming practices, the way we farm, if you like, is one of the keys to capturing much more value from the great things that we produce. So finding ways for the market to reward sustainable land uses. So in that sense, good management practice um, and the value chain are, are really tightly linked. They certainly are and remain so. Um, in my mind. Um, conscious of the time, I think it's, it's I, I should now introduce our, our first speaker. There has been a slight change in the program, folks, and I'm, um, I'm sorry about that, but fortunately I became, I became aware of it five minutes ago. 
Um, we're going to, I'd like to introduce um, first to you, um, not the minister, but, but um, Tom Lambie. Now, I first met Tom when he was um, president of Federated Farmers, and he came to a meeting that we, we threw at ECAN. It was probably about 2004, and we were just starting a discussion about this um, nitrate thing as an emerging problem. How real was it, and, and how far uh, were we going to go with it? I've got to know Tom um, an awful lot better uh, as an ECAN commissioner um, over the past few years, and, and certainly in his role at ECAN in my time there, he was a, an enthusiastic supporter of, of some of the big projects uh, that we're undertaking, including uh, the Matrix of Good Management Practice initiative that I, that I mentioned earlier. Tom's been chair of the, um, the Opua, Wa Opua Water Limited. He's been chancellor of, of Lincoln University up just up the road, and in between time, farms are a reasonably substantial property um, at Pleasant Point. The thing about Tom that I really like is that he, under, or one of the many things actually, is that he understands that nexus, you know, that connection between the economy, um, the environment, good resource management, and the power of the community uh, when it comes together to work collaboratively. Tom. Tenakoto e ro rangatira ma tenakotakato. No Tiana Wai Aho, Ko Tom Lambie Aho. It's um, fantastic to see everybody here today. And I think the, uh, the title, Kai for Canterbury, is incredibly fitting. Uh, because at the end of the day, when we're all looking at water quality, actually, we can talk about nutrients, we can talk about nitrogen, we can talk a lot of things. But it's actually, what are we trying to achieve in our waterways? And it's about the Kai. And the Kai is both water and it's terrestrial, because what you do in the land has a huge effect on the, on the waterways. And so that's the basis of what we're trying to do here in Canterbury. And we're on, um, I guess, quite a significant pr progress um, in trying to achieve that. Uh, one of the things um, that we did uh, when we were uh, first appointed as commissioners, is that we built on the work of the previous council. And the previous council had done two important things, but the biggest one was they had put together um, the Canterbury Water Management Strategy to find a way of getting the community to work together for better outcomes. And then the other one in the Natural Resources Regional Plan, they had also been quite far-sighted in looking for stock exclusion. Uh, for, 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 for cattle in intensive areas. And when we came into the Environment Canary Council in the Land and Water Plan, the two things that we did uh, to bolster that immediately was our stock exclusion rules, so that we wanted people to manage their, um, their riparian uh, areas between um, around fresh water, and also that we immediately put in place um, a base for nitrogen leaching around 2000 and 2013 years that said there can be no more, particularly in areas uh, that were already over allocated. And that's sort of given us a base to work forward from. From there, what we wanted to do um, was actually um, work with the community and work with the farming community uh, on this issue of good management. It rings in my ears that constantly uh, the farming community came to us and said, we will farm at good management. And so we said, what is that? And so very kindly, uh, they went away and they worked. And we, we've got the first draft of what became the industry agreed good management practices relating to water quality. And so that was the first time that it actually was put down on paper all of the different issues that farmers had to do to meet good management. And I guess one of the things that this booklet and its, and its successor at a national level, sorry, um, actually shows is that we actually have to work at a whole catchment level. Every individual farm is different, whether you're in the foothills, whether you're on the plains, or whether you're down here uh, by the lake. They're all different. And these cover all of those different situations. And so we need to be, um, so whether it's nitrate or phosphorus or sediment or E. coli that is your most important issue, uh, this, is, this has got a prescription of how you do that. 
I was very proud, as, as Ken has suggested, that we then said within Environment Canterbury that we wanted to codify this and we wanted to be able to put this within the rules within Environment Canterbury uh, that would allow us to be able to uh, judge farmers against their peers on good management practice. And um, I'm not sure what the stress levels of Ken was like, and I know we put a lot of pressure on the staff, but we achieved in two years uh, what was meant to be a four-year project. And, um, and that was an amazing um, effort for everybody involved. And I'd just like to pay tribute uh, to the science community who underpinned this and the wider community who helped uh, develop the rules that we now see in Plan Change 5 and in the form of the portal. Uh, so it was incredibly important and um, peer reviewed. And I guess one of the things I want to stress is that it is a living document. Everything that we do is a living document because we need to be able to change and adapt as we get to know more. Because there is, no, there is only one thing we do know, that there is more to know in how we do it. The good thing about the good management practice um, was that we then were able to identify where the properties who were most at risk for water quality. And so we were then be able to stay, step back. And I guess one of the things when we were looking at good management practice, we were able to look at the different farms, whether it was a dairy farm, whether it was a dryland sheep farm, and the different types of farms. And we could actually say, actually, well, these are the farms that are most at risk for this particular nutrient. And we very quickly identified, as you can all imagine, uh, that the farms who were most at risk for nitrogen were on lighter, uh, more shallow soils, and that they, they, need, they were going to be needed to be treated differently. And we identified uh, that through um, irrigation, it was the most likely way that you were likely to get intensification on properties. So when we did uh, Plan Change 5 and the rules uh, for the full uh, introduction of good management practice, uh, then we said they're the properties that we need to have a land use consent. And I think that's been one of the biggest breakthroughs that we've had uh, within the Canterbury community in that process of farms that are most at risk have to have a land use consent. So it's farms greater than 50 hectares of irrigation and with some variation greater than a hectare, 100 hectares or 10%, whichever is the lowest of, of intensive winter feed for dairy cattle or for cattle. And so we identified those at most at risk and, we, and, that's, and that's what we're working through. So that means that we can um, get those land use consents in place. Uh, there's approximately um, 3,800 that fall into that category. Uh, but the interesting thing when we worked through the metrics of good management, and we looked at particularly our dry land farmers, and their biggest issue was sediment and phosphorus loss. Actually, their good management practice was so tightly bound because of the constraint of their dry land environment, at, we made them a permitted activity provided uh, they can demonstrate through a farm plan uh, that they can actually look after the key elements of phosphorus and sediment uh, that are most likely to impact on our waterways. So again, concentrating firsthand where we needed uh, to make the biggest difference. And I guess uh, from moving through from the land use consent, that means that we then, uh, within one year of being granted that land use consent, uh, we move to an audit process. So someone with a detailed understanding of farming systems then comes on to the property and actually assesses you against what you said would happen in your farm environment plan, uh, your nutrient loss budget, and the, and the other conditions within your consent. I don't think that happens anywhere else in New Zealand. We then grade them on A, B, C, and D. An A means you're at the very best of your game. A B is you've got things to do, but you're still very good. A C and a D, and particularly a D, is saying you're actually, you're failing, and that you need to do something about that. This is very serious. If you get an A, it could be three years before you, you were audited again. If you get a D, we're coming to see you on a regular basis until you move out of that. 
And anecdotally, we've heard from the irrigation companies where they've formed a collective uh, to deal with their consents, uh, that they're actually saying to people who have a D, we're actually not going to supply you water. So the farming community is actually saying, uh, this is what we expect of you as a minimum, and that we really want to make a huge difference. And I guess what I found within the farming community to date is that people are on now on a journey of continuous improvement. And that if they see, if they've got an, they've got an A, they're, they're not feeling complacent, but if they've got a B, they want to get to an A. If they're a C, they definitely want to get to a B or an A. And so we're, we're making quite significant strides in that. And I'm pleased to report, and Nadine or some or others might be able to give you a, an accurate figure, but the majority of farmers are in the A or B category. And so the conversation we're having is relatively small. Time is relatively short, but what I want to just say is just how important the community is. And, you know, this, this, it, this is about everyone working together. And it's about the regulation, as I've described. But a huge part about water quality is also about the non-statutory things that we do. So unless we do the riparian management, unless we get the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the native plants and the riparian plantings that we've seen, because water quality is not just about nutrients. Water quality is about nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment. And if we can help to exclude those, uh, then that's great. But it's actually all about a whole lot of other things. It's actually about shade and, and, and the invertebrate life that comes from the terrestrial land that actually ends up in the water that helps feed the Hemingakai that we have in the water. So there's a whole range of things that we need to do if we want to have better water quality. It's not just simply um, a regulation of what happens to the farm. Uh, we need wetlands. There's a whole range of things. And I guess one of the things that we have through the 10 zone committees uh, that we have throughout Canterbury is they acknowledge and identify that every different catchment in Canterbury is different. Every river is different. Every stream is different. And what do we need to do for that stream, for that catchment, to actually make a difference? And that's what we're working on. And um, we were at the Legs property um, earlier on this morning, showing, showing the minister um, some of the good things that are happening around riparian management and on-farm management. And, um, you know, it was a, quite an inspiration to see what's happening, but the scale that we need to do is also quite, um, is quite daunting. And um, one of the things that um, with the zone committees and with Environment Canterbury, uh, they've identified the things that we need to do in the catchment. Uh, with Environment Canterbury, we need to have a discussion with our ratepayers as to how much they might want to help us um, in helping the farming community and other landowners uh, to actually do that. And um, we've also got some hope that with a combination of uh, the community, with Environment Canterbury, and potentially with the government with their new uh, billion dollar trees and the regional growth fund, that actually we may be able to help in that regard. Um, because if we could accelerate uh, what we do around riparian management, um, then we could actually make a huge difference uh, to what we do in Canterbury. I mentioned it during the, um, the, the process of the um, uh, matrix of good management in the GMP, but I just want to pay tribute uh, to the scientific community and how blessed we are in this area to have uh, Lincoln University, land care, ag research, plant and food, um, who, as well as a whole lot of other scientists from Dairy NZ and Beef and Lamb and a whole variety of different people, who are actually coming together to do the research, to do the work that actually is going to make a huge difference. And the great thing about doing it here at, at, within the Lincoln Hub is that actually it's developing uh, research and processes that actually significantly help. And so around irrigation management, around uh, different fodder for cattle, um, as we've seen with the ecotain, with uh, standoff pads, uh, there's a whole lot of things that are happening that actually are going to transform farms. Because the one thing with good management practice is it's not good enough. If we actually want to achieve chi in Canterbury, 
we need to go beyond good management practice. And we will never do that without research and without farmers like John, who are actually wanting to experiment and do different things. So we have a range of farmers doing different things. But if the core of what we do is actually to move beyond so that we actually reduce the, the nitrates, get the planting in the ground, make sure that we're looking after the soil, uh, then that will be uh, what it is that achieves what we're looking to do and guarantees us uh, to get kai in Canterbury. Norera, tenakoto, tenakoto, kato. Uh, well, look, thank you, Tom, um, and, and thank you uh, for reminding me of the, um, the extreme stress you put us through um, uh, w while we were developing the, the MGM project, which, or, which I'd almost forgotten about, thanks to the, the therapy and the drugs. Um, hard to believe I'm only 35, but um, it, it, it was also an exhilarating time, I'd have to say. Now, now the, the second of our speakers, uh, and, it, and it's my, uh, my privilege to introduce the Honourable Damien O'Connor. Uh, kia ora. Um, ko Paparoa te maunga, uh, ko Kawatiri te awa, ko Ngati Pakeha te iwi, uh, ko Damien O'Connor ahau. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, can I acknowledge uh, Mananui, Liz, um, Naitahu, um, thank you for your welcome both to the farm and to here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be along here to say a few words and uh, I'd like to acknowledge Ken, uh, Tom, um, uh, Nadine, organising things. Uh, to the mayors here, um, thank you for allowing me to be in your territory um, in the Great Canterbury. Um, look, we're here today to talk about uh, and launch good management practice and I was just looking GMP and for the farmers in the room um, and the economists, it's not GDP, it's not GNP, uh, it's not GDT, uh, global dairy trade for those who don't know, uh, it's GMP and probably the most important of all these as we move forward uh, as a farming uh, nation. Indeed, agriculture is the noblest profession you can be involved in. Feeding people comes even before shelter. And it doesn't matter whether you're Māori or Pākehā or you're anywhere in the world, but feeding your family and your community is the most important thing that you can do. And we've lost sight of that across the world as people roll up to the supermarkets and pop in with their trolleys and pop out with their food. And we should never forget that. Can I say that as a, an incoming government, um, we have stated a few bottom lines for uh, agriculture, farming, and indeed all our sectors utilising land and water. We want swimmable rivers. Um, we don't want erosion, so ongoing soil erosion. Um, we want to move and make improvements to the area of climate change and reduce our emissions. We've stated that quite clearly. I have to say it was an honour um, a few weeks ago um, to go into the North Island to go to Bill and Sue Garland's uh, farm. And if anyone, and I know some of you are down from the North Island, uh, and a magnificent property um, bounding on a huge uh, a mainland island, effectively. Um, and I guess to, um, in launching the Good Farming uh, Practice uh, Action Plan, uh, we got to see firsthand their property, but also to share, I guess, the enthusiasm that they have uh, with a group of people a bit like this up there. And it's great to be back. I was a farmer um, in the 70s and 80s. I, I spent a little bit of time down the road here uh, learning more how to drink than anything else. Um, I have to say, I'm sure it's different now. Um, uh, the point is that I, I guess I've grown up off a small dairy farm on the West Coast. I hope I've always had an understanding of the land. I've certainly always had a passion for it. Um, and we have been part as farmers uh, of a profession who said we're the best in the world. You know, we've always said that. We don't do much with pride. Um, we say we're the best rugby players and we're the best farmers, but we're quite polite and, and humble people generally. But we've always believed that, and I think generally proved it to be the case um, across farming for quite a number of years, quite innovative. But we started to learn a few things, I guess probably 15, 20 years ago, that maybe our environmental practices weren't what they should be, that when I was farming back in the 70s, just pouring the effluent from the cow shed into the local stream probably wasn't the best thing to do. 
seemed to grow big eels at the time, but uh, that was a small herd. Um, and so as we grew, we started to understand the impacts on the environment. And so I'll acknowledge that our farmers are the most innovative and adaptive in the world, but they have to be given clear signals of what is right. And in, a, in our attempt to be the best in the world into the future, we've got to take on board all the information um, possible uh, to change our practices. And indeed, that's what we are doing here. The government's objectives for agriculture have changed. Uh, it's not just about doubling exports. Um, it's about growing from volume to value. And I go one step further and say it's growing from volume to values because the products that we produce for the people in the world who will have to pay more for them, believe it or not, they're going to have to pay more for milk powder, for butter, for cheese, for all our fine meat, because we have to ship it quite a long way to the markets. And we pay a bit more for land, and we want to pay our staff a lot more because they're worth it. Our cost of production are no longer the lowest in the world, as we were so proud of. So we're going to have to get more for the products that we sell. And in my view, uh, those products um, will have values attributed to them. People who have more money and who can afford to buy New Zealand products will be making judgments uh, on the basis of knowledge through traceability and hopefully a connection with us as a country because we do produce the finest for them. And the values I talk about are two here, kaitiakitanga, that is wide stewardship of our resources, and manakitanga, that is sharing and caring about the people we connect with. So when we sell them the food, we're selling them nutrition and health and a better life and a longer life, perhaps. And in that way, if we can connect with our customers in the world, there'll be huge demand for our products. They don't just want to buy food, they want to buy a healthier future. And so those are the values we have to attribute to our products and connect to the customers. And in doing so, we have to do it with integrity. So if we're going to produce the finest, we have to do it in the finest way. And that's what we're talking about here today. Can I acknowledge, um, firstly, the legs for the farm uh, today, the visit, it was inspiring. I've never seen that much grass cover at this time in the winter. Amazing. Can I acknowledge the um, focus on soil science? Um, I, I have a brother who has a passion for that. And I too understand that we've actually dumbed down soil science. We've, a lot of that knowledge has dissipated around. We need to gather it back because it's a core part uh, of our future. Can I say that, um, you know, that farming enterprise is a family one where, you know, three generations have followed through with sound farming practice, but taken on board the new knowledge. And so planting cracked willows, you know, around the waterways was the thing you did in the past, but now getting rid of them and planting indigenous um, for, for riparian planting is the thing that we have to do into the future. And so it was a great visit, and uh, of course it, it highlighted, I guess, the development of what we're talking about in, in good management practice um, is that protection of Te Waihora, the lake, and that acute issue um, that ECAN became aware of and the community became aware of, and, and we had to do something about it. And that has driven a lot of this, the wisdom and the sense that has showing through into good management practice that we hope will go right around the country. Can I just, I, I'm not going to speak for too long, um, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions when we come up here on the panel. Um, from government's perspective, can I firstly, sorry, can I acknowledge ECAN? They've been kicked around a bit over the years, um, you know, and, and I'm, without going into the history, it's been pretty hard for them as either a councillor or as staff. Big challenge here, huge growth in agriculture, huge growth in the impacts on, on the environment with, as I say, inadequate knowledge in terms of both water management and soil. So they've had to play catch up. Can I acknowledge the work they have done and, and hopefully uh, this, you, know, you support them in carrying on and doing more work. Can I just say that um, from government's perspective, uh, we've put more money into overseer, which we hope will be a useful part of farm plans and management tools. Uh, we've supported mitigator, which is another add-on component to 
to better measuring nutrients, inputs and outputs and water and all the rest of it. Um, can I say that I have a, a, a vision for one farm plan covering all the requirements of a farmer or a farming operation? Because I understand the resistance from farmers to bureaucracy. Um, I won't use some of the words they use, um, but you've probably heard them quite often. And it is um, for someone who has a passion for the land, it's a big hurdle for some to get their heads around what are compliance issues and an increasing number of them. They are necessary, but we have an obligation, I guess, as policymakers to make it um, effective um, and efficient, those are the words, and kind of user-friendly. So one farm plan that covers, let's start with overseer, mitigator, um, that works through uh, the issues of, of biosecurity, something dear to my heart, that works through issues of, of um, labour management, the staff management, um, and then all the other add-on components that dairy companies and others are increasingly expecting um, from farming operations, assurances that when they pick up the milk or the animals, that they've been treated fairly, animal welfare protocols are met. If we can have one farm plan that allows a farmer to work with someone who can assist them through that process, both an educational uh, and I guess a, um, a requirement uh, or, or, or a regulatory requirement, uh, then maybe we'll all get ahead and share that knowledge and better practice. So that's my, my uh, hope. Uh, I, I'll leave you with, um, and some of you may have heard it, um, a kind of analogy uh, that I use around the place. And we can only feed 40 million people. We might be good farmers, but actually we can't feed the world. We can help feed the world. But in terms of the products that we produce, and this talk of provenance, and I'm sure that you know, we can develop a Canterbury brand, it used to be Canterbury lamb, we can do more in other parts of the country. But in Switzerland, a country that is very small, that produces 1.7% of the watches in the world, they get 50% of the value of watches sold in the world because they have a product that people desire to have. And no one needs a watch. No one needs a watch today. So if they can do that, then in terms of food and protein for the world, surely we can produce the finest and get some of the best returns. And in that way, farmers will be profitable, the environment will be managed properly, and we'll all be better off. So that's my vision. Thank you very, very much for the chance to say a few words. Um, and, and I'd just like to acknowledge once again all the people who have contributed to the good management plan. Um, this is you know, the start of a journey. Um, this is not the finish of it. And we've got to help roll this out around the country. Kia ora. Thank you, Damien. Look, I know I don't, I don't need a watch, but I've just got to keep an eye on the time, sorry. Um, look, I've just been thinking about what you said and, and what Tom said, and you know, there's, there's something really important there, and I, I could say those comments later, but I'll say it now in, in case I, <laughs> I ran out of time myself, but it's, it's that comment about, about innovation and regulation and, and where we put farmers in, in that connection, and it strikes a real chord with me. And one of the key messages that comes out of the good management practice story, certainly here in Canterbury, and also out of the work that I'm involved in now, is the recognition of the importance of letting farmers actually get on with it. Farmers are great innovators, and we must make sure that the kind of regulatory frameworks that we build around this um, don't discourage that, that creativity and flexibility. I mean, farmers are problem solvers. They rise to technical and science challenges they make hard choices, they put their money where their mouth is, and, and the rest of us need to make sure that that, that, that framework we, that we put in place is going to support them. And then as a community, make clear the values that, that we need to protect and enhance, and then get alongside and, and help make it happen. Um, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, uh, who's the second Damien, uh, Damien um, Farrelly. Now, Damien is uh, the Quality Systems Manager at an organisation that many of you might have heard called NZ Gap, and the Gap bit stands for Good Agricultural Practice, so it's kind of right on the button for what we're talking about here. That's an assurance scheme owned by Horticulture New Zealand um, for, for growers of, of, of fruit and vegetables. So 
uh, Damien's primary role there is the development of an environmental module um, and a sustainability program to enable growers to meet both regulatory um, and market requirements. Um, and I think you've got some slides you're going to show us too, uh, Damien. I just want to say that Damien does get the prize um, uh, for the best uh, title today. Thanks, Damien. The Future of Farming started yesterday. Hello, everyone. Um, I might apologise that the title was actually given to me, so I can't take credit for that. Thanks, Ecan, for that. Um, so, the lesser known Damien in the room, but I recognise a lot of people in the room that I work very closely with in this area. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I work for New Zealand Gap, which is an assurance scheme owned by Horticulture New Zealand. Horticulture New Zealand is the peak body for fruit and vegetable growers here and are heavily involved in a lot of these initiatives um, around environmental compliance. So we, our um, president is on the Farmers Leaders Group and our CEO, Mike Chapman, is on the um, action plan, the environment action plan that was mentioned earlier. So uh, at the, the top level, there's, there's buy-in here and we have a very capable natural resources environment group, Rachel, who's uh, based here in Christchurch, um, working at making sure that the policies align with uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do in horticulture. So just a um, bit of an overview of my presentation. Um, just want to talk about certification in New Zealand horticulture, which is what NZ Gap is. Um, a bit of a talk about regulatory versus market compliance. Um, NZ Gap sits kind of in the middle of that. Um, there's market access and market premiums. What are the, the comparisons there and what, what are we really looking for? And then a little bit about telling our story. The horticulture conference is on this week in the um, Air Force Museum just down the road. And um, this whole idea of telling the story, the horde story, is a, a very big part of that. Sustainability comes into that, compliance comes into it, and um, you know, the individual grower versus the big picture of New Zealand horticulture, and then New Zealand as a country that's exporting. Um, just a few numbers around the New Zealand horticulture, around 5,000 growers, a very high employer because lots of, lots of labor involved with, with growing good produce, um, very high valued, and um, yeah, we, we export a lot, so over three and a half billion, um, and are moving to I think ten billion within the next couple of years. So, massively growing, and um, as I said, there's that th that balance between domestic supply of um, good nutritious food as well as exporting to those premium markets. Um, so about certification, ends a gap. Primarily, is about building trust with your consumers and regulators. Um, the reason why ends a gap was thought up in the first place about 20 years ago, growers have been asked for different things from different retailers. And um, if you look across the water in Australia, that's pretty much the same for horticulture there. The retailers are trying to align their standards, but that's a, a difficult and complex thing to benchmark. Um, so what it means for growers is that they get about five or six audits per year asking the same stuff. So um, New Zealand in general, very good innovators, and we're ahead of the curve in a big way uh, for this. So um, the two main things that NZ Gap provides is that license to grow, so aligning with the, the regulations, and then access to markets, so keeping consumers and retailers um, on site. Um, there's a big focus on outcomes, so what, what, are your, what are your issues? Is it environmental, is it food safety, is it biosecurity? Um, and what is the most effective way of, of achieving that outcome? Because it's owned by growers and run by growers, there's that ability to say, well, we have a say in how we want to meet those standards. We're not trying to apply a, you know, something from a process and plant onto a farm. It's, very, it's a good agricultural system, so it's um, based on agricultural practices. Um, very complex, horticulture goes from kiwi fruit to uh, um, one crop to, uh, that's export focused, all the way to you know, a grower that has 20 different crops in one field. Um, and we have massive corporates all the way down to family farms. So um, certification doesn't care what kind of um, si size it is or what you're doing, but um, it's a about the outcomes. So the main areas that we work in are food safety, which is the, the primary reason horticulture is high risk crop, um, a high risk food area because of the um, because it's fresh produce. Um, but increasingly recently, with social practice outcomes and environment, social practice because you have a lot of labour, a lot of contractors, um, horticulture is seen as a high risk area for potential exploitation. So we have social practice standards in those areas, and that's mainly driven by the market, but also by New Zealand law. Um, and by having it in the system, similar to environment, 
growers can demonstrate to their regulator and their market that they're meeting those requirements. Um, independent audits is a, a big part, as was explained earlier on by ECAN, is um, you, you're building that trust. You're saying that I'm not telling you what, what's, I mean, I'm telling you what I'm doing, but you can have um, faith in that because there's an external party come in and has a, had a look based on the standards and says, okay, these guys are doing what we expect, therefore you can trust them. Um, so over 20 years, New Zealand has a very high rate of certification compared to um, around the world, and I mean, that is because of the, the export focus. You compare it to somewhere like America, you know, less than 20% of growers are certified, and um, a, huge amount, a huge amount number of crops. So just a bit of a comparison then between regulatory and market. On, on the left, you have some typical um, uh, legislation that we're trying to implement. Food Act is an example. You know, the horticulture industry has food safety systems that have been placed for a very, very long time. Um, and we've been working very closely with MPI for a very long time as well for um, acceptance of what growers are already doing. So it's more like about recognition than setting a new bar. And again, we're trying to focus on the outcomes rather than the processes. Um, because the more administration you add, you, you, kinda, you need to get buy-in from growers. The more you add administration and extra costs, then they just they disengage. And more and more growers are saying to us, actually, NZ Gap already meets this requirements. How can we get, just get the tick because of that? Then you have some of the harder stuff, access to land, labor, water, nutrient allocation, uh, the very tricky areas that we, we operate in. On the opposite side of the, the market issues, and in general, for horticulture anyway, the, the market has driven compliance much more so than the, the regulatory side. As I said, NZ Gap's been around for, for 20 years um, because consumers expect, uh, consumers expect and therefore the retailers have to add them compliance points on because they have to protect their brand. Um, when it comes to the market though, the quality, variety, taste, they're the things that, are, that make New Zealand produce wanted in the market. You know, New Zealand kiwi fruit or um, wh whatever that is. Um, it's because of our quality produce that we primarily get, get that that premium. But there's also those things that you can't see. So is the food safe? Has it been sourced sustainably? Are the, are the staff paid good, good money and given good working conditions? They're the things that you can't see, but more and more consumers want, want to be able to trust that. So NZGAP kind of covers a lot of these things. Um, we talk to the growers and um, they would probably say that the value kind of goes this direction. They can see what the market's doing and what the market's asking for, then they can get some extra value there. Um, there mightn't be necessarily a premium associated with doing some extra compliance, but it, gets the, it gives the growers a key to the door. They can say that if I'm doing what the, my customer's asking and the, the other guy can't, then I'm gonna get my produce sold. So it's more about market access primarily than, than actually getting a premium, um, and, and that's a, a very important thing to note. Unfortunately, a lot of people associate this direction with cost and complexity, um, and there's numbers of reasons for that. We're not getting into the, into the detail of it, but essentially, um, a lot of growers I talk to feel like we're already doing a lot of the stuff that we need to be doing, and it's kind of about getting recognition for it. But we spend a lot of time explaining um, that we're, what growers are doing and that, that it meets those requirements. There's a couple of examples of some, some premiums that have been achieved, and New Zealand wine gets about 40% premium in the UK, and again, that's the quality of the wine and taste, as well as some of the, the attributes that they have. So they have a sustainable wine and growers um, certification and 95% of, of growers are in that. So they can, they, they can market their produce as sustainably grown and it's one of the, one of the things they're able to really sell in, in the markets. Um, and then you guys locally would know more about uh, Sinai Leeward Pride um, and they have a sustainability program which additional to NZ gap, but things like animal welfare, there aren't too many animals in horticulture, so we don't have that pillar. But um, you can, they're, they're give, give farmers a premium if they can get that certification. And they have a tiered system, similar to, I think Tesco have a, one as well, where you, know, you have gold, platinum kind of levels, um, rather, or gold elite. Um, and there's, there's uh, premiums to be achieved there. So as I said already, you know, there's market access and, and the brand is like, can you get market access? Um, some of the bigger companies like Sinai Leader Pride or um, Countdown as a, as a retailer, they're more worried about protecting their brand than necessarily giving someone a, a premium. Um, so just getting that balance right between, you know, is, is there a premium or is it just about retaining market access? 
Um, and then the other thing we have to be careful about is if we push up the premiums on all our produce, then how much are New Zealanders going to be paying for their food? So um, for, for horticulture, vegetables, 94% are sold domestically. Do, do New Zealanders want to be paying a premium? They want all these things as well. So um, just to offset the cost of that, it's more difficult for the domestic produce than um, for those premium export markets. Again, something that needs to be, need to be considered. So why trust farmers? Um, again, in horticulture, we're a big fan of certification, but there's a number of uh, those out there in New Zealand and, and worldwide which prove that growers are doing what, and farmers are doing what, what is expected. So, um, you know, sustainable wine growers, we already mentioned, LEAF is a UK um, environment program, which is uh, actually worldwide, but um, run out of the UK. Um, Libra Pride, the Red Tractor, which was primarily around traceability, so biosecurity is a big thing on the, on the topic at the moment. Um, you know, BSC and foot and mouth, there was more and more pressure for, uh, on, um, on growers to meet those, um, those requirements. So they kind of expect food to be safe, but they want to know something else. So whether it's social practice or traceability, they want to know that that's done. So NZGAP has developed an environment program to help um, get into this space of um, trusting farmers even more and getting into the, the detail of what is required in regional councils, as I said, which is kind of complex. Um, just a quick example then of a, a market concern around environmental. So food miles um, around six or seven years ago, and it, it's still still a big topic worldwide. Is like, how far has my food come to me? Especially if it's, um, especially when it's food, people say, well, what about our local farmers? Um, and luckily, New Zealand kind of had been doing some carbon footprint on, at the time, and they were actually able to show that the carbon footprint of New Zealand produce had a lower carbon footprint than locally sourced produce on a on a shelf in the UK. An extremely powerful. Um, bit of analysis using the same metrics, the same standards. So um, again, bring back to that, that benchmarking thing, it's very important to look at what's happening around the world. It's not just about, like Canterbury is extremely important locally, but how do you compare to other, to other regions? How do you compare worldwide? Then you can start having a conversation talking the same language. So just like the metric system, you can compare and contrast. So a couple of examples of the results that came out. For dairy on a, um, per tonne of milk solids, 50% of the carbon footprint of that in the UK. Um, and there's multiple reasons for that. Apples, 68%, uh, and lamb, 24%. So it completely debunked the, um, the argument, and New Zealand produce kept their market access. Um, whether they're still getting a premium or not, I said there's other <laughs> factors there. But um, shutting the border down and not being able to get your market access, it takes a hell of a long time to get it back again. So, Having these things in place is very important. The main reason for this, New Zealand's an efficient producer, counter-seasonal. They really want to have those things on the shelves in, in the UK. If the lamb section of the, of the supermarket gets taken over by something else, it's very hard to get the lamb back on there. So um, just from a, from, a lo from a marketing point of view, it's important to keep, uh, keep things in the same place in, on supermarket shelves. Um, and then the food miles is actually offset by cool storage. So if you're looking at fresh produce, they have to store it for months and months in um, big cool stores. So the freight suddenly isn't as big of an impact because otherwise they'd be storing it. Um, so moving on to just telling the story. So a lot of you in the room are aware of the sustainability dashboard and NZ Gap works really closely with these guys. Um, and the bits at the bottom were probably doing quite well already, addressing regulatory requirements and the, the market, um, supporting business improvement. Um, but then at the top, Support and communication to stakeholders. So who are your stakeholders? Is it the market? Is it the local community? And what, what information do they need to know? Um, and then the other thing is measuring your, measuring your progress, measuring your impacts. So how have we improved our environmental um, performance over, over a period of time? Or social, economic, food safety, whatever. Um, and a lot of discussions that I have lately is that everyone wants, everyone wants the data because everyone wants to be able to tell their story. But the way to do that it seems to be, are oh, we all going to collect it separately? From the farmer's point of view, they're given information out to 20 different stakeholders, and they all want it in a different format. So when's the gaps move from the compliance thing, but also moving into this area of actually, well, we need to have a, a central place to hold this information so that it can easily be reported. So a lot of partners here, like uh, Naitahu and um, ECAN, Zespri, Trevallians, and the gap are all industry partners. Um, and it, it can cover the entire supply chain. It's an extremely complex system, anyone that ha have a look at it. Um, but what it 
builds up into is being able to tell your story at a really high level. So whether that's um, ECAN or it's Selwyn or it's a group of farmers within the catchment, you can kind of um, pull the information together and tell your story. Or at a really high level, the sectors or New Zealand itself. So the good example that comes up on a very regular basis for me, and I'm going to do the bad thing and bring it up myself, is the Origin Green version. So in Ireland, um, you know, they've done a really good job of people don't hear about global gap and compliance and stuff that much. They hear about Origin Green. There's a whole lot of things going on in behind that, which feeds into this high-level story. And um, whether it's New Zealand's 100% pure or whatever the other brandy might be, you have faith that everything else that's going on behind actually is, um, is worth the premium. So for an individual grower on the other end, they know that they're getting maybe an extra cent or an extra couple of cents based on this, um, this thing here. Um, New Zealand talk about project origin. It's in its infancy, but what, what does that look like? And how do people get around the table and feed, feed into that higher level discussion? So the future started yesterday. What is it going to look like for, new, for, for ECAN? Is it a product? Is it an ECAN story? Is it a New Zealand story? And as I said, um, from, from horticulture point of view, certification and benchmarking to those international metrics is a, is a major part to play in that. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Damien. And uh, look, I've, I've actually got some questions, so I'm sure others will. We'll, we'll catch you in, um, uh, in in a few minutes to, uh, to to run through those. But I but I really like that that story about um, well, telling your story for one thing, which is really important, and the and the global perspective, you know, the international considerations, which are really important. Our, our next speaker is Chris Allen. Um, he is here. Yes, he is here, Chris. Um, welcome, Chris. I, Everybody probably knows Chris, but uh, unless I go through this introduction, I don't get paid. Um, Chris and Anne-Marie farm at, at Annadale, which is uh, just outside Ashburton. Chris is, um, uh, you know, seriously heavy duty in, in federated farmers. He's their uh, spokesperson for the environment, um, you know, mostly water and biodiversity and also uh, uh, pest management. He was a member of the, or is a member of the, of the Good Farming Practice Governance Group uh, that we've already heard about. Um, he's been heavily involved and continues to be in the Canterbury Water Management Strategy through the Ashburton Zone Committee. And most importantly for me, actually, he's one of my buddies on the Land and Water Forum um, and has kept me sane there for a number of years. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, that, Ken. Yeah, um Land and Water Forum, that's the place where we have literally pins to poke our eyes for stimulation. But we've come up with some great things. And um, so when Nadine said to come along and have a few words, and I thought, well, which role do I talk from? You know, is it being involved in a zone committee, or is it being involved in something to do with federated farmers or Land and Water Forum? But I thought, no, I, I'll talk from a farmer's perspective. Because it was back in about 2013, it was a beautiful day, typical Canterbury day, and Tom rang me and he said, would you like to be part of the governance group of the GM, the Matrix of Good Management? And I said, yeah, that'd be really good, but what are we going to do? He says, well, we've got this MGM thing, good management practices, we've got to come up with a plan and sort of oversee the technical group on what it's doing. And I said, yeah, we'll do it as long as we can add value. This process has got to add value to farmers, what they're doing, how they see what they're doing on their land. So I'd like to put a bit of a farmer's lens over things. And I just remember one of the days that um, the technical working group had come along to the to the group, and they had all these, they'd surveyed the farmers. Beef and lamb had gone out, and dairy and zed, and hort, they'd, and deer, they'd, pigs. They'd gone to their farmers and described what all these different GMPs were. And we looked at this, we were in little wee groups, and looked at this big collage of these things, and I thought, there's a bit of a theme here. And Tom and I said, yeah, there is a theme. But it wasn't like the technical group had put it there. And I said, well, there's something here about fertiliser, there's something here about riparian, and something about irrigation. but." Jerry are looking at it from one perspective, beef and lamb or something, irrigation. So there's themes. And the next time we came back, the, the technical group, we had pretty much those 21 different principles. They are principles. They aren't really the GMPs themselves, because you actually go and do the actions based on those principles. So it was actually putting a farmer's lens through it. What makes sense? So we um, had a bit more of a few, few more meetings, a bit more, but then the technical group through Melissa was doing a lot of neat work trying to get numbers around what does GMPs and what do good management practice numbers look like. 
And that there's built up that booklet. And I thought it actually started making sense. Because I go back to my journey that I've been farming for about 25 years and thought, we started farming, we had irrigation on the farm, it was old border diking, it was sort of done quite a cheap way, I think. And over the years, we've gone through border diking that was rough and ready to laser precision border diking. We then went to rotor rainers and spray pumps. We've gone to pivots and laterals. Didn't take regulation to do that. We could see the water efficiency drivers was telling us what to do. Same thing with fertiliser, because I, when people want to understand what is GMP, I say, well, when you go to the principle about fertiliser that they've got in there, it's about what does your crop need? So you go and do a soil test. What have you currently got? What does your crop need now to grow to your target? And just basically you're linking the two together. I don't put the fertiliser on that my granddad did back in 1956. I actually do something with a bit of an evidence trail. So that's the, the lens that I was putting through that. Then we got to the Land and Water Forum for the fourth report. And there wasn't a lot of detail about good management practices, but we pushed away and we kept on chugging away and said, GMP is what we've all got to do. It was sort of like the baseline. We talk about baseline, but to me it's a responsibility. It's the responsibility of what we need to do. It's not an allocation mechanism. So we looked more and more into that and they came up with recommendations. Then about 18 months ago, we got the call up to say, we need to put something together to actually drive or deliver what is GMP. And there was a bit of discussion went on in feds and said, well, GMP can apply to anything. You can be in the medical industry, you can be into logistics, anything you want. But this is about farming. So let's call it good farming practices. So we came up with the, the name of good farming practices. It actually means something. So that those people that are in urban, as they come up with good urban practices, will know that there's a, a level of equivalence of what farmers are already doing. So over that time, we tried to work out what were the things, themes that we needed to do. So we picked, ran with the, the book that was developed for the Canterbury by the, our national organisations. And we sort of said, are all those principles relevant nationally? Because every, like the words we've heard today, every catchment is different. There's different drivers in it. And then if you took those principles and said, OK, what are the big problems you've got in this catchment in the East Cape or this one in Southland. You could go and then you could prioritise what you need to do. So that's where our action plan came in. What are the, our other challenges we've got? Well, through the MGM process, there was the reg other regional councils looking in on it. And I went along to a meeting with it in Wellington where they were all talking about good management practices. And what they were talking about in the Waikato seemed it was going to be different to what we were talking about in Canterbury. They were talking about um, dairy effluent. And we said, well, dairy effluent's dairy effluent. It's just how much storage you have on the farm. That's the only difference in the principle, or how you apply it, where you apply it. So what this actually did is actually meant that Waikato now started looking at what the, the good management practice booklet was telling us. So there's a bit of consistency there. Then we, we also had, in amongst this governance group, we had government officials, we had regional government, and we had national government, effectively. Um, and so the strength and what I see in the good management practice process we've got now is as a farmer, I know that my industry group, I know that my regula uh, my, um, the regulator in my area, Environment Canterbury, Environment Southland, Waikato, whatever, and the government all understand what good farming practices are about. And we can all be on the same page. It all comes down to what we were previous speakers talking about, the NZ gap. We've got to be able to tell the story. And through doing good farming practices and the, through farm environment plans and whatever, and all those practices, we're telling the story, what the responsibility that our farmers are we're delivering. And I just think that there's um, a, another really solid bit. I've just done a market trip through the States, and that's what they want to know. They want to know where your food came from. Is it, are, are you local? Um, particularly around New York, how far it had come away from was just not far down the road. But if we could tell the story about animal welfare, all those sorts of things, but let's not overcomplicate what good farming practice action, action plan's about. It's about getting those key 20, 21, 22 different principles up and running, but we won't have to do all of them because some parts of the catchment or your farming system won't need them. So yeah, I just sort of, um, that was the lens that I put through as being a farmer on this and what we can do and how we can deliver it. And um, we can all go out there now and actually talk because we know the government 
our regional councils are all on board with it, and our industries. We're not bickering over what the wording is, and we've actually got a mechanism that can actually live with it running forward. Because what I was doing on my farm 25 years ago, through constant evolution, the good farming practices will evolve. The principles pro probably won't change at all, but the actions that I take as I go forward um, will actually improve over time as we get the, good, the leaders who are right out the front who are pushing the boundaries and how's the rest of us start update or uptaking. Uh, just a quick example of that was um, a few years ago, Craig McKenzie, he came along to Federated Farmers in Ashburton and said um, some of the stuff he was doing with moisture probes in the ground and how wonderful it was going to be and I thought, you bloody idiot. Three years later I was actually buying the same equipment that he was talking about often. <laughs> so look, it's just that you've got the, the the leaders right out the front who are really pushing the boundaries, and then as you get confidence of what they're doing makes a difference, we all then pick it up and run with it. So that's what we do. So I'll just leave it there, and um, it's been great to be part of this, and Minister, thank you very much for coming along and being, being part of this as well. So thank you. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, and you'll be joining us in the uh, Q&A uh, panel shortly. Um, that's just an observation, it's not an order. Um, I, um, I, I want to introduce you now to, um, to Sana Cohenberg and, and Tamati Cunningham. And in my run sheet, oh, I've got this thing I've got to sort of stick to here, they're described as, it says, introduce youth reps. Um, and I thought, that's not quite right, is it? You know, this youth rep, they make them sound like a kind of a, a special interest group. Um, they are really important part of our community um, with a particular voice and a particular story to tell. So I'm, I'm, I'm very honoured to uh, introduce both of them. Perhaps if you, if, if you come up now, and I'll just say a little bit um, um, about it. We're actually going to show a video, but I thought I'd introduce you to, to Sara and, and Tamati now. Um, Sara is uh, a Year 13 um, student at Avonside Girls High and Tama is year 11 uh, at, at Cashmere High School. Um, I'm going to ask them some questions after the video, but I just wanted to say, I, I wanted to read something um, now, which um, Sana wrote and, and provided us by, by way of biographical detail, but I think it, I'm just going to sit, read a bit of it because I think it actually will, will speak pretty well for both of you. Um, so, so she said, I'm interested in this topic because it's evident now that our waterways are not healthy and a lot of things are changing and will continue to change. So I come to these events to see what other people's opinions are on the issue and what changes I can make to hopefully make Canterbury a sustainable and healthy place to live. That's not going to work. We need to get some sort of co papa of the space on how we're going to treat each other and are we going to act in respect and listen to each other and listen to each other's opinions and ideas. Okay, so environment, would you like to share how you feel? I feel like I've been under so much pressure and everyone's putting so much on me and I don't know how much more I can provide before everything falls apart. My biodiversity has gone down immensely since we got together and now I can see it plummeting. If we don't start restoring and helping it, it's going to keep going that way. I can see that you're really hurting the environment. Economy, do you want to share how you feel? I feel like I contribute the most. Environment, you're being selfish. I need growth. I'm providing a high quality lifestyle. People could not live the way they are used to if I am held back. Okay, so we have two people that are really hurting today, but we haven't really heard from culture. How do you feel? I feel like the tikanga of my people has been forgotten, whilst everybody is so caught up in the conflict between the environment and the economy. I have been forgotten. Okay, and society? I don't feel like I'm the cause of this conflict, but I've definitely been caught up in it and it's taking its toll on me. I'm suffering from anxiety, depression and stress because of the pressure from the environment and the economy. The farmers within me are under the blame of the people. They're suffering from the pressure put on them from the economy and the environment. And they don't have enough support from the rest of me because I'm so divided by the environment and the economy's influence. There are many aspects that need to be balanced in order to create a good way of life. 
some ways we can improve this is by creating small changes in things we do every day. For example, we can plant native trees along waterways. Even simple things like washing cars over lawns, so that the chemicals can be filtered before they go into the waterway. One of the biggest changes we can make is not being afraid to talk to and converse with like-minded individuals, as well as people who come from different viewpoints. This is the first step to sustainability and hopefully a way to change perspectives. So all of our passions are really high and we all have to have our say, but the only way I think we can find some sort of resolution is to work on collaboration, education, connection and courage to move forward from here. My strength is from, not from myself, but from the group together. So society and culture have clearly been caught up in this. How can you work together to build more resilient communities to help the economy and environment move forward? If we look to our past, our values and beliefs can be used to ensure our future. Kaitiakitanga, guardianship. Kotahitanga, collaboration. Fanongatanga, family. Rangitigitanga, leadership. Society, do you think we could reconnect the people with these key values? Yeah, I totally think we can. Environment and economy, would you be willing to get on board with this to make the change that we want to see in the world? As we can see now, the status quo is not prosperous for the environment or the economy. We need to reassess our way of life to reconsider what we value and how we treat each other in our physical environment. I was here long before you and I will be here long after. If you listen to each other and respect me, I will support you through whatever we do together. How can I help? I understand that the economy based on constant growth cannot support a world with limited resources. The earth provides enough for everyone's needs, but not for everyone's greed. If you lay the groundwork for a sustainable future, I will distribute wealth fairly. It's amazing what we can do when we all share our feelings and actually talk to each other. It's quite beautiful what can be gained through listening and respect. Obviously here, everyone here is very passionate and wants to help each other, and we all want to be part of this change. So we have found that every choice we make will have consequences. Whether these are positive or negative will depend on personal perspectives. But what are the consequences going to be if we don't do anything at all? Farmers are willing to change, but some are held back by personal beliefs and way of life. Lots of farmers are doing great things, but some need a little bit more motivation to, and determination to get to where the environment needs them to be. 90% of wetlands have already been drained and it's continuing. We are going to lose so much biodiversity, our biology lessons are soon going to turn into history lessons. If it is environmentally unsustainable, it is automatically economically unsustainable. Think. In 30 years, how am I going to swim in the river on a hot day? How am I going to fertilise the soil without clogging the waterways? How am I going to drink fresh water? Um, and that was pretty compelling and, uh, and impressive and I, I'm I'm going to ask you each two questions um, that kind of relate to that um, video. So, if I'll go, you're the film star, so I'll, I'll, I'll go. To, I'll go to you first, and, and this, simply this: Why is this topic so important to you? Um, well, I guess because as the young people here today, this is like our future that we're talking about, and you guys here are laying the foundations for us to do it, and we don't want to just sit back and not do anything. We want to come and help and share our ideas, but also learn from all the practices that have been done so far and just collaborate with everyone and share ideas because all ge different generations are going to have different experiences and knowledge, and what they've learnt is going to help everyone to put their ideas together and make a good future, hopefully. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Uh, for me personally, it was all about the mahinga kai, the networking between uh, one another. And, you know, many, many years ago, people, um, tribes from over the west coast would trade their ponamu for our land resources, our, moana, our kai moana, our, you know, our fish, our power, our mussels, you know, back then the moa. But, um, they would trade and network with one another and families, um, alliances were all built on this. and. <coughs> 
I think that's what we need to strive for now is being able to create those, uh, is to be able to network with not just New Zealand but other countries around the world as well. We already are, um, we already are at the moment with trading around, with trading around the world, but also now we need to say that we are clean. We are, you know, we need to make a stand of saying we are clean, we are green, and tell them that tell them our story and what we've been doing for so long, and let the world know that this is what we've been doing. Uh, yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. And the second question: What should we be focusing on in the future? Um, I think one of the important things would be just collaborating with as many people as you can and um, listening to other people and how they do things because they're going to learn from it. And then, of course, just um, interacting with different generations and allowing them to share ideas so that we can optimise the land that we have here as, to the best we can because New Zealand has like a very... What's the word? Like an abundance of different types of lands. So some of the land's going to be better for dairy farming and some of the land's going to be better for like crops and sheep. And so I think if we use those lands to the best that we can, um, yeah, it's just going to make the value of it much better so that we can create a sustainable way of life. Yeah. Just kind of was going to go back to what I was saying, is um, yeah, letting the world know our story and what we are doing. Um, years ago, um, our elders were telling us stories about what they did. Um, this is a Māori culture. They were telling us stories of what they used to do. They used to swim in the they used to swim in the rivers. They were able to do that. Now, sadly, I'm not able to. They used to be able to swish, uh, not swish, uh, fish. Sorry, off um, the end of the wharf in Kokorata, where I'm from. I can't do that without catching a couple sharks or stingrays these days. I want to be able to look into the future when you know, I'm telling my grandchildren the stories. I want to let them know where we, what we are facing now, and I want it to be able to change for them later on in the, uh, in the future so they can make a change and, yeah, in the future. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thank you very much. No we'll, we'll see you again shortly. Yes. Um, <clears throat> We're going to get the speakers up very shortly. I was actually asked at this stage if I, if I could offer some reflections on the things that we've heard, and I, I'd like to. Um, I'd like to kind of take half an hour, but um, I'm not. Time's, time's running out, so I'm going to try and be, be pretty brief. Um, but, yeah, we have heard some really important stuff over the last hour. We've heard some history, and it's really important. That's why I think events like this are so great. You know, sometimes we, we need to just look back and see how far... Uh, we've come on this journey, and, uh, and events like this are a great initiative. We've also just now looked into the future, and that's, um, I think, asked, posed some really interesting questions for us. I mean, where will tomorrow's leaders take us? I mean, one thing for sure is that sustainability is at the top of um, that agenda, uh, and people like, like Tama and, and, and sort of want to be working with us. And also, we need to have those sophisticated conversations about value and, and values. Um, and, and as, as um, somebody said in that video we, we've, we've just seen, you know, how do you turn that, that values conversation from one that's about either or, you know, the economy versus the environment, to actually one that's about and? We've also talked a bit about the role of regulation and how important that is in, in framing the way we do things and the importance of being enabling and, and uh, in doing that. And we've talked also about value add, which is really about um, you know, what's the connection between value add and innovation and brand, and, and is this the key to coupling good management practice with good environmental outcomes? But I wanted to just finish with a, with a <laughs> by actually going back to the start of the day for us, uh, that we were lucky enough um, to go out to um, yeah, Andrew and John's place um, uh, near, near Lakeside um, and to actually go onto the farm, and that's kind of really important because that's fundamentally what this is all about. You know, it's this action on the ground that, that we're seeing. And the, and the thing that impressed me about what we were hearing at that place was that this is a really joined up, kind of integrated story, their story. They're not just thinking about, you know, how they manage the banks of Birdlings Brook in terms of, of, of riparian management. They're not just thinking about 
uh, how they manage um, you know, pasture of species to, to optimise water use. They're not just thinking about um, how they run their herd for milk production. They're thinking about the farm as a system where all of the components are connected um, and they're all interdependent. Um, and that's not just the, the biophysical, it's the social, the cultural, um, the environmental um, and the economic. And we have to start thinking, in fact, we are thinking about our catchments in exactly the same way, and we need to think nationally about those things. So I've got a really powerful message for me today. So I'm going to invite all of the, um, the speakers up onto the stage now, because this is an opportunity to uh, answer some questions from the audience. I just want to touch a little bit more in regards to the Canterbury story and in regards to our relationship with our culture. Because I think this is an opportunity that we kind of haven't quite now today in some of our post conversations. And I really want to talk about that because it could be a defining moment for us as Kiwis. So we have an opportunity, we've had an opportunity in Canterbury here around Te Waihora in regards to its, its significance culturally. Incredibly significant and we haven't gotten an hour and a half for me to give a presentation on it. So I've got to find some words really quickly. With GMP, good management practices on farm, given that it's our predominant land use, we have an opportunity to tie in cultural values, that voice that has historically gone lost. And, I, and my, 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 my memory goes back, not just my lifetime, but it goes back 150 years to the sales of the Kent Purchase, 170 years treaty. I am a pre-claimed child. The question I'm asking of government, that we have government present today, but also I know that in this, in this room, we've got industry, we've got council, we've got farm and community groups. We've achieved something in Environment Canterbury that, sorry, in Canterbury, through Environment Canterbury, sure, that sees that historically quiet voice starting to get heard. Actions on farm that we saw this morning at the Leagues Far Nose Farm that supports and enhances mahinakai values. Mahinakai is a terminology, yesterday it meant one thing, today it is GMP, but it's an A++ environmental attitude that is ethically correct. And it is something that we actually need to pay a little bit more focus on, especially if we're branding ourselves globally. Because the people today, they're far more educated, they're far more savvy in regards to where they spend their money. And if we can achieve saying and stating something that says, look, these this milk was provided on a land that was socially, culturally responsible to, to indigenous nations, uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna do very well. And so my, I guess, not necessarily a, a question, but more my statement is moving forward, other, other uh, regions throughout New Zealand, I really challenge and I really, uh, with a whole heart, uh, inspire those to to take up opportunities like uh, mahinakai or, or growing really strong relationships with iwi um, and, and obviously, you know, through our responsibilities through the RMA, that C word, we've all heard of the F word. In my opinion, the C word is consultation. We could do better in that space. And, and, and being collective and being... being... Um, inclusive of all stakeholders, our treaty partners, is very important um, for the future of kai, the future of land use. In this case, it happens to be farming. For us and for those generations to come. So my big challenge is to government, take a look at what Environment Canterbury has achieved in this space, cultural land management, uh, and, and I would love to see a commitment made to install that that sort of template, that sort of model in every other region throughout New Zealand. Because globally, that's the difference between us and them. Kapai. We have a unique country. I mean, we have a bicultural nation and multicultural society. And, and so firstly, building off that bicultural nation, it is truly unique. I think while we're not being perfect, I think we have a partnership, there's an obligation to consult, and I think for the most part, we do a pretty good job. And I guess if ever there was an issue or an example of where that's worked really well, it's here, uh, around Te Wahora and, and the interface between the, you know, the 
commercial realities of farming and the cultural realities of trying to protect um, yeah, Ataonga. And so other regions of the country are doing the same, maybe not as acute, um, but they are doing the same with, with those interfaces, where, whether it be um, with the marine environment um, or, or, you know, up in the, the, with the forests in some of my area. Um, so I think if we don't utilise that unique story, and for the most part it's a very good story um, around the world, um, and turn it into value, then I think we're, we're you know, dropping the ball. And I think people are starting to appreciate that just as we're learning about better environmental management and stewardship, I think we're learning about better cultural uh, interaction and understanding. And, and I think there are companies and iwi organisations turning that into direct commercial value, but I think as a country we can, we can spread that value across everything we do. Thank you, Winton Daly, Mayor of Hiranui District, uh, Foundation Member of the First Zone Committee and the Canterbury Water uh, Management Committee. Um, my question, Minister, what resonated with me, you talked about one plan, and every speaker has touched on that issue, and in your summary, Ken, you talked about the family farm and all the issues that they need to tie together and bring together to have a sustainable farming business unit. Um, I unsuccessfully tried to um, float this idea through a district plan review two or three years ago, but the, the community at large was too siloed to understand that you could bring this together and not have their own uh, plan requirements. And, and I see you um, smiling up there, Mr Federated Farmers, and you know that there's probably 20 or 30 requirements on a, on a business to meet compliance. On top of that, you've got industry integrity um, plans to take care of, and why can't we bring those together? So my, my question really is, and please stop talking about farmers, can we talk about food and fibre producers? Talk about producers, food producers? Um, because that's what, that's what we are, and that's what some of us have been for generations. So my question, Minister, and to anybody else who wants to have a crack at this, how can we undo, smash these silos, and bring planning together so we have a comprehensive uh, plan that actually tells a story and it, it, it takes care of compliance and also takes care of, of, um, of product integrity for our exporters. I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, you've got to be careful using the term one plan when you're in Manawa um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, too. The point is that the concept I think is evolving and, and every year I think the, f the farming or the food producing community is moving forward. You know, they are wanting direction, they're wanting leadership, and they have more information. And so I think, you know, never say never. Because it was rejected then, doesn't mean to say it won't fly now. And I think it's a matter of presenting it in a way that shows this is valuable, adds value, to use Chris's term, to everyone in, in, in every part of the, of the food producing chain. Yeah, look, that's one thing we've been pushing forward, is having consistency across all the different aspects of government or regional government, so that, um, the example would be um, like an irrigation scheme. I've, I've got friends who supply Fonterra, they supply um, one irrigation scheme or they to do with ECAN and they end up with four different people coming out doing a, a, an inspection, all for the same thing. I think there's been a bit of working together on that and now I think one, one inspector can sort of tick all the boxes for the same inspection that they needed four different requirements for. When it comes to doing biodiversity, um, all, all these things are going to actually eventually come in in some way, shape or form, but we've got to make sure we take small steps, solid steps that we don't have to unravel and go back and then have another crack at. And I think as, you, as we look back in the last 10 years, we, how far Canterbury farmers, food producers have come and what they've been doing, and they're doing some really neat stuff, but how you start telling the story, we've just got to make sure we make solid gains and going in the right direction. I'd hate us to go on a really big step and then think, holy crap, we've got to go halfway back and have another crack at it. At the Land and Water Forum, we ended up with this huge, um, Kirsten Bryant put it up there, this massive thing there of all the things a farmer does in a day in compliance. You could call that their, their farm plan. And we were talking about one tiny little wee part of it. But what we need is different parts of a plan that all dovetail together and, and tell that full story. And because some parts of the country will want to talk about um, cultural values, some might want to talk about biodiversity, some might want to talk about water. 
and some might buy security, but we want to make sure that we're on the, we're dovetailing it together so you can actually aggregate up and tell it a factual story that actually means something. Is it to the market or just to the farmer? Or is it to the bureaucrat that just wants to know they've, they can see something? So it's just got to be there for a clear purpose, and, but we are making some pretty solid gains over the last few years. Environment can be certainly interested in the one plan from a regulatory imperative. We needed to deal with the issues of the day around water quality, uh, but in the omnibus rules that we're, we're looking to do in um, uh, before 2017, we're looking to build in cultural values and Mahinkai values. Uh, we've got rules around Inanga uh, spawning sites. There's a number of things that we've done. Uh, but we are really keen because we did that from a regulatory point of view. And um, we really uh, want to build in, as the Minister has also already said, uh, biosecurity. Um, it's an imperative that farmers really take control of their own biodiversity, um, biosecurity. Uh, but in doing that, then we can start to build in other biodiversity values that we want on farms. And so with, uh, in conjunction with the uh, territorial authorities, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had the one plan? And then there's a whole lot of other issues that the Minister has suggested around labour laws and different things that should all be incorporated in one place uh, that makes it really easy for everybody to see what we're doing. Um, I could just add then from the, from the Hort sector that, um, that the title was The Future Started Yesterday and the Hort sector probably had this um, idea around 20 years ago that we had all this compliance and everyone asking for similar except different stuff. Um, and that has, food safety is a fairly broad agreement worldwide on what food safety looks like for, for horticulture, but it's still an ongoing effort just to even keep up to speed with the benchmarking and, and everything. Um, but it all operates in, in the same assurance framework. And what we've adopted and other gap schemes around the world have done is adopt a, a modular approach. So if your customer or your regulator is asking for social practice, then you can add that to your core system. If you don't need it, then you don't need it. Um, rather than forcing everyone through absolutely everyone, everything, and then you don't get anywhere. Um, so consistency in a, in, a, in a framework and then on outcomes, so the environment action plan, that national plan is something that we would certainly support because the high, at the high level, there's certain things that everyone wants. Everyone wants cleaner water, everyone wants um, you know, swimmer rivers. So um, that's the outcomes, but then the framework that you can achieve that in, whether it's through extension or through auditing, that needs to be kind of agreed at a national level because then you can have consistent conversations and you can you can add things on. Um, talking about telling the story then, it's about what are these practices that actually lead to other things. So Mahan Kakai, for example, it's not necessarily if growers are doing all the environmental things they're supposed to be doing, they are improving Mahan Kakai values, but do they know which ones are, are most effective? And it's more about actually, um, and I know there's work going on in this area that identifies those things that you're already doing that are um, are adding another benefit. So um, yeah, I think the yeah getting the getting the framework there is is a big part of it, um, and yeah, linking linking things together. Thanks. Uh, good morning, uh, Ben Curry. I'm a zone committee member from the Ashburton zone. Um, Minister, I was going to uh, hopefully try and butcher a tenuous link to your um, uh, connection with Switzerland. Um, uh, we heard a lot today about uh, water quality, um, and indeed, uh, Councillor Lambie uh, listed a number of issues around um, water quality. The one thing that he didn't mention was water quantity. Um, water quantity uh, is, and access to it is, is a critical, critical factor. Um, in the in the farming industry, and it touches a whole a whole range of um, of aspects, um, cultural and social as well. Uh, and if I can also make another link to um, the the future started yesterday. For me, it started um, probably 70 years ago um, when the Ministry of Works um, was uh, involved in uh, infrastructure um, and irrigation development. Um, if you look across um, to the Hines zone, uh, and we've just been through uh, the Plan change two. Um, there are some significant changes that have got to happen there in the farming community in terms of uh, nitrogen reduction. But that only gets us halfway there. There's also um, an injection of um, water quantity through Manage Act for Recharge, you'll be familiar with it, that, that has to take place. Given what the forefathers did um, with uh, irrigation infrastructure, uh, and given this government's um, 
uh, dissolution of the, the Crown Investment uh, Irrigation Company, what assurances have we got that we're not making short-term decisions uh, for long-term error? Um, look, it's a very fair question. And, and where does the government support irrigation and water storage? The issue is the quantum and where and how you manage that. And I guess that there'd been a period of, of rapid expansion in irrigation. And I guess particularly in Canterbury here, concerns that, that the only viable utilisation being dairy was creating a whole lot of environmental impacts. And I think most people in the room would probably accept that. Um, there's a couple of things. Firstly, uh, we wound back that big fund uh, for big projects, but we're still committed to smaller projects that are more focused in a zone or in catchment type process. Come back to the point that I think we need to broaden the range of options for land use. Water is absolutely essential for anything we do. But we've been through a period where most people thought that dairy was the only way that you could pay for those schemes. Hence, the social licence to continue almost evaporated. We've got to have a reset that is accept, and, and the government certainly does, that water is essential for primary production. We've got climate change and probably an increasing need for that in certain areas. But ensuring that we use it in ways that are sustainable is really, really important. Um, and, and environmental sustainability, of course, but the social and, and cultural uh, and economic. So take wool, for example. You know, the failure of, of the sheep industry to off a, offer a viable future for farmers meant too many of them converted in areas where they should still be sheep farming. Now, we've got to get wool underway. It, it, it's an incredibly valuable product, and we've got to help them get ahead. We've got some good times with meat at the moment, or for the moment, so the government's approach is to broaden the base and we may end up going back to a more, I think it was called uh, mixed cropping enterprise, I think when I was at Lincoln. That is that there were people who had farms and did a number of things to, to spread the risk. We've ended up, I guess, being, um, I, I say, mono pasture species um, and mono uh, kind of... Um, operation, farming operations, that is that the diversification hasn't occurred that we had in the past. So the government's position is we will support irrigation, they will be smaller schemes, they'll be more focused, but there must be appropriate land use. Um, Corrine, the, look, there's time for one more question. Actually, there isn't time for one more question, but I think we should have one anyway. Well, well, we've got this opportunity, um, and I saw um, David Cagle's hand go up there first. Um, but I, I guess if we could if we could do this without the without a, a you know a, a, a lengthy albeit eloquent prologue, <laughs> that... Ken's clearly never heard me ask a question before, <laughs> um, and I I'm doubly challenged because what I really want to do is make a statement rather than ask a question. <laughs> but I'll do my best, uh, Minister. In the light of what you've just said. Could you take away from today's discussion the view that I think is fairly widely shared here, like Ben, I'm speaking as a member of the Ashburton Zone Committee that's <coughs> delighted to be able to come today. Could you take away from today's discussion our view that we think what we've already achieved in Canterbury is in effect your reset? There was a slide that said something like working, f working on Kai for tomorrow since 2012. I'm absolutely confident that that date is a reference to the point when nitrate discharge limits were put in place as a matter of law, as a matter of a rule. Hmm? We've adopted the view that we as a regulator shouldn't be telling farmers what land use choices to make, so long as they meet the environmental limits. Those are now in two forms. One, a set of nitrate limits, and two, an obligation to meet GMP, or I'm happy with GFP if that makes it easy for people to understand. Those two things, nitrate limits and GFP, are our reset going forward 
everyone has to comply with them. My question is really, is, is that understood and accepted as a reasonable approach to resetting going forward? Look, I, I think government um, would acknowledge the incredible work that has occurred here, both through ECAN, uh, through the zone management committees and proposals and the reset and, and acknowledgement of those limits. Where I, um, I, I do believe we need to continue work because I ask questions around the lateral movement and the vertical movement of some nutrients and we're also focusing on P and on sediment in water. So it's not just about N. And, and so too often I can't get clear responses to that. And I've said out at the farm, the area of soil management and knowledge has kind of, not evaporated, but it dissipated. And, and soil scientists have moved out around the country at a time when we've needed more and more knowledge in that area. I think um, we know that there's a, there's a end load somewhere there, moving down or out, or we don't quite know, um, and, and that offers a, an ongoing challenge for us. So I think that, and acknowledge the farming sector's commitment to limitations uh, in the knowledge that we have, there are still some unknown challenges for us around environmental management that we need to acknowledge. And, and so we've said swimmable rivers, including sediment, including pea, um, and there'll be some adjustments as we work through with farmers and with ECAN. So I think, you know, this has been at the forefront of the new area of knowledge. That is that we can't farm without limits. We can't continue to just grow without um, unsustainable consequences. And so ECAN and everyone here has been trying to grapple with that. We, we want to help, and I guess there was a view, um, and, and it's no good debating it now, that just continued expansion of large-scale irrigation was going to add to the problem when we needed a reset. And I think um, that the reset is occurring and that we will once again embark upon water storage in appropriate ways for appropriate uses.